All right, tonight we're coming to the end of our study in 2 Peter as we look at chapter 3. So let's begin by reading the, the verses that are there. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming day of, the God, of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters speaking in, their, in, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the un unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures, to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, and fall from your steadfastness. But grow in gr the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, he starts off with his aim. Who is, who is this letter aimed, for, aimed at? The Christians. Okay, he calls them, he's, he's, he's returning to the beloved. He's saying this is his second letter, and we know that to be true because we have both First Peter and Second Peter. But what is he writing these things? Why, not what, why is he writing these things? Because people were leading them astray with their sayings. Okay, the false teaching is leading them astray. But he also says right here, he's trying to, to remind them. He, he, he wants to remind them of the things they heard from the holy prophets. Uh, who are the holy prophets? He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. But also, the commandments that Jesus himself spoke, as it's been relayed by the, the different apostles. So he's, tell, he's telling them, if you, if you remember chapter 1 was talking about the need for spiritual growth. Chapter 2 was giving a warning about the false prophets that are coming and we need to be on guard for it. So he's saying now a way of reminding us to remember what's been spoken, remember what the Word has to say. Because the best way to, to grow is based on the word of, 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 of the Bible. The best way to defeat false teaching is to know the true teaching that are contained within the words of the Bible. So remember what has been spoken by the prophets and what has been spoken by Jesus himself as relayed by the uh, and communicated through the apostles. Then he goes in in chapter th in verses 3 through 7 or th with, an with an admonition. He says, know this, in the last days, mockers will come, 
uh, what are they when, when these mockers are coming that Peter's talking about? What are they mocking? What are they saying? Where's the promise of this covenant? Yeah, they're denying that Jesus will ever return. They believe the universe is unchanging. They said, they said, you, you preachers have been talking about that Jesus is coming back, that he's going to return. Well, where is he? He said, from the, from the time all of our ancestors have died, this world hasn't changed at all. It's still the same today as it was then. It'll be the same tomorrow. So they completely deny uh Christ has returned because to them, since the universe is unchanging, to them Christ's return is totally impossible. But Peter's answer is they've willingly and purposely forgotten a, catacly a cataclysmic event that took place. In verse five and six he talks about he's making reference back to the time when the world was destroyed by noah how did the world come into existence in the first place by the word <clears throat> and what word are we talking about spoke god spoke it he spoke it into existence he said let there be light let there be land let there be whatever he was he just spoke it into existence now, what was the earth when it, when it was created? What was the earth formed out of? What was it? It says water. It was water. It was water. It was on during during the process of creation. Then he called the, he he separated the water and the land. But it all came out of water. I don't know how many years it passed from the time that God spoke the world in creation until the days of Noah. But in the days of Noah, what was the world condition like? It was horrible. It was bad. It was evil. It was corrupt. And God even went so far as to say, I'm sorry, I even created man. And so he said he's going to destroy it. Now he told Noah, he found him to be righteous and he, he told Noah, build an ark. And in that time he was building an ark, he said, preach to the people and give them a chance to repent. Preach a message of repentance. And what happened? They continued to mock and they continued to make fun of. And keeping in mind, when Noah said it's going to rain and it's going to flood the earth, it had never rained on the face of the earth before. So they mocked him. But then, when God gave the word, and how long did it take Noah to... Build the ark, by the way. 120 years. A long time. <laughs> now, I don't know if it took him that long because he couldn't go any faster or if it was a case of God made it, made it take that long to give the world a chance to repent, the message to be, repeat, to be a preached of repentance. But he preached, repent, repent, repent. The scoffers and the mockers kept saying, no, no, no. And at some point in time, God told Noah, get in the boat. God shut the door. And then what happened? The rain started falling. Now, how did the rain start to fall? Suddenly and fast. But how did it start to fall? What caused it to start falling? It never rained before. God did. And what did God do? He made it rain. He said, he said, rain. He spoke it into existence, didn't he? Didn't he say, by his own word, I'm coming back? Yeah. And yet the mockers are saying, yeah, y'all say that, but he hadn't done it. This world hadn't changed. Yet he, Peter goes back and says, remember, God spoke this world into existence. He formed it out of water. And God spoke this world into, to, into destruction, saving eight people, and he destroyed it by water. So the whole thing is talking about this unchanging world, which is their basis for saying that Jesus was not, was not going to return, was the very reason that their argument is wrong, because this world 
this unchanging world, according to them, has totally, radically changed. Well, what's, what, 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 what is all this doing? It's really setting up and introducing you into verses 7 and 8. <coughs> Present creation has been preserved, waiting a different judgment. Now, the, the prophets and Peter and, and the apostles and Jesus himself said he, that Jesus is coming back. Mockers are saying, nothing's changed. He ain't coming back. He would have already been here by now. But look at verse 7. By his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So, Peter is letting us, reminding us that the world in which we live in, the world, the world that we see right now, it's going to be destroyed. The world was originally destroyed by the word of God through water. Another judgment will occur by his word through fire. And that will be the destruction of the universe. By his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Where in his word does it tell us that's going to take place? It don't tell us. It does tell us. Where, where does it tell us that's going to take place? That, that, that this world is going to be destroyed. That the unrighteous and the ungodly will be destroyed. The revelation. Revelation, is, it tells us. Daniel tells us. Some of the other prophets prophesy about it, and Joel and Zephaniah and some of these other places. So the, the word has been there. By his word, he spoke it into existence. By his word, he destroyed it by flood. By his word, he restored it after the flood. And by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire the day of judgment. Do the mockers have a point, though? He said, for 2,000 years, now, this is not the mockers of Peter's day, but the mockers of today, for 2,000 years we've been preaching that Jesus is coming back, and he hasn't come back. Do they have a point? Well, not really. They don't have a point because they don't know. They think they do. Based on man's concept of time, they've got, they've got a point. But, it's part of Peter's assurance. Look at verse 8. Do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. The delay in Lord's coming is only a problem from the human perspective. God and man look at time differently. Now, this, for these two phrases, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day, reflects Psalms 90, verse 4. God views time with a perspective that humans lack. If a thousand years is like one day, how long has it been since Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead? Two days. Two days. <laughs> but we do look at time differently, don't we? Let me ask you a question. And, I, and, and this is not a philosophy. Today, did, did today drag on for any of you guys? Yes. All right, Paula said it, and, 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 and Gina said, yes, it drug on. I thought the day went by very fast today. Yet it was the same amount of time. How come it is y'all think it drug, <laughs> and we thought it sped by faster than ever? She was laying around on the couch. I was working. <laughs> Well, she, that's the way women are. Yeah. The longer you get, the faster it goes. <laughs> I know yet. It's all because we look at it differently. Sometimes time flies. Sometimes it drags. But with God, it may appear that he's working slowly, but he's never slow about his promise. That's what verse 9 tells us. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient. So it's not him dragging his feet. It's not him being slow, working slow. It's all about an 
illustration of patience. Why is it that Jesus has not come back yet? It says he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to reach repentance. Hey, we, he wants one more. He wants one more. Now, is he coming? Yes. Yes. When is he coming? When he's ready. When, when God says go. <laughs> When God speaks the word, but he's, his delay is not because things aren't, uh, aren't ready on his end. He doesn't want one more. He, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In mercy, and that's all it is, he has given us time to repent. So, verse 9, the, 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 the sense of verse 9 is this. God is patient toward you not wishing for any of you to perish, but for all of you to come to repentance. But, like the unexpected arrival of the, of the floodwaters when it started raining, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It says in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So, as that day of the Lord comes, and the day of the Lord is nothing more than, a, than judgment day, it will come, the earth and all of its works will be consumed with intense heat. Now, Revelation teach, and many scholars believe that the day of the Lord will cause this present earth and heaven as we know it to be destroyed, and it will be replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. Now, many people, what happens in between the time that tribulation takes place and the, God's kingdom is established on this earth with new Jerusalem, new heaven, and new earth? The millennium. The millennium. Peter doesn't mention it specifically. So there are, some, there are some biblical scholars and some biblical readers that I don't exactly hold as scholars who contend that since Peter didn't mention the millennium, that, that, that tells us there's no such thing. He goes straight from the day of the Lord arriving to a new heavens and new earth. Yeah, in response, it is true that Peter doesn't specifically mention a, the millennial kingdom, but it's an argument from silence to say that it knows, because it's not mentioned, it doesn't exist. But it is mentioned in a different place. It is, in, in, in other popular places of Scripture, yes. But there's some thoughts as to why Peter didn't mention it here. First of all, there's one argument says that Peter's omission of the of the is not mentioning the kingdom the millennium was he was just simply presenting a simple panorama of the end times of the end time events um, without every detail included included in that and if you look at that the Old Testament prophets did a lot of that same thing talked about it in general secondly the millennial kingdom is in some, some scholars' view, implied because of the fact he talks about the day of the Lord. That phrase, the day of the Lord, uh, brings, about, brings this world to a close. And according to the Old Testament, it contains the idea of a messianic kingdom within it. Um, and if you, if you look at the rest of Scripture, there's two parts to the day of the Lord. It has an evening, which is the judgment time that we call this, this, the Great Tribulation. And it has a day that follows, according to Joel and Zechariah, that is a time of profound worldwide blessing. That is the thousand-year reign of, of, of Jesus on this earth that follows the tribulation. So when the day of the Lord is complete, both the seven-year tribulation period and the thousand-year millennial rule, then this world will be destroyed by fire and a new heaven and new earth will come. The millennial will come to a close and the new heaven and the new earth will last forever.
And that's pretty much what Peter was, was, was emphasizing is the things that will last forever. But the bigger question is, since we know that there are people who are denying that Jesus is going to return, but we know that he is, and the day of the Lord is coming, and he will come suddenly, unexpectedly, like a thief in the night, and judgment will take place, and destruction of the ungodly men will take place during that day of the Lord. Knowing that it's going to happen, how, how does that affect the way we live? How does it affect the way we conduct ourselves? That's what verse 11 says. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Good question. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, what link is there between what you profess, you believe, and how you live your life? Well, these shouldn't lead to apathy. Uh, these, these events that Peter's been talking about should not lead to apathy, should not lead to despair, but rather it should lead to an expectant hope of the Lord's coming. He said, we are to look for, as, as we are looking for, and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. But according to, uh, so in verse 14, he tells us that since everything is going to be destroyed in that coming day, as we await for that day to come, according to his promise, we are to be diligent so that when he returns, we are found in peace, we are found to be spotless, and we're found to be blameless. <clears throat> peace, spotless, and blameless. That's what we're striving for. How does those characteristics, which are these, are these not characteristics of a true believer? That we're living in peace. We're trying to be spotless and blameless. Are those characteristics of a true believer? Yes. How do they compare, though, with the unbelievers? How does it, how does it contrast? Well, for one thing, they have no peace. They have no peace. They live ungodly lives. They are totally and completely living for self and they're godless in almost everything they do. So again, he's telling us that when, when we know these things are coming, that Jesus is going to return, the world will be judged, the millennium will be set up, and then this heaven and earth will pass away and a new heaven and earth shall come. We are to be f diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless. Keep your finger there and flip back to the book of Titus. And if my hands will start shaking long enough for me to get there. In the book of Titus, Paul is saying exactly the same thing in chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, what Paul, that's how Paul wrote it. Peter is saying the same thing. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. 
And in verse 15, he goes on to commend uh, Paul, seconding the fact that he too has suggested these same, or presented these same ideas. He said, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, speaking of these things. Now, first of all, he calls Paul our beloved brother, demonstrating his love for Paul. They didn't always agree, but Paul recognized him. I mean, Peter recognized in Paul's writings to be scripture. So he recognized the scriptural authority. Now, some of Paul's writings were hard to understand. Ain't that an understatement? But unbelievers that are untaught or unstable individuals, they will take these, which untaught and unstable are the words that Peter used in verse 16. They take those words and they twist them. They distort them. They take them out of context. They apply to different meanings to them than what was ever originally intended. They do that not only to Paul's writings, they do that to the, all of Scripture. But Paul, I mean, Peter says that's to their own destruction. So he said, therefore, and anytime you see therefore in Scripture, you need to stop and find out what there is, what the, the there is for. Therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall away from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Mm -hmm. You know, even there in that benediction, as He closes, He's contrasting a true believer from a false believer. Because a true believer gives glory to God, to Jesus Christ. False believer seeks glory for themselves. But growth, he said, grow in grace and grow in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth must always be it one of our objectives. If you're not growing, in fact, the word grow in your grace is not a one-time event. It's actually present, imper uh, present tense imperative, which means to continue growing. Continue growing. How can you grow as a, as a Christian? How can you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Spend time in His Word. Spend time in His presence. Spend time in prayer. And I think it helps spend time with other believers. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to be involved in church. There's a lot of people who say, I don't need the church. I can worship and find on my own. Well, maybe you can worship fine on your own, but you sure can't grow. That's the way God intended us to grow on your own. But be steadfast and grow. Now, last question I want to ask, and this is stepping out a little bit from the, from the, directly from the text. What is next on the calendar? The day of the Lord, right? The day of the, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When is that, when is that, the day of the Lord is what's coming next. I'm mean, including that day of the Lord. I'm including the rapture. I'm including the tribulation. I'm including the millennium. When is Jesus coming? When he wants to. Somebody get... When the Father tells him. But when is that going to be? It doesn't tell us. Well, Jesus why don't we know? Because <laughs> he said we ain't going to know. He's going to surprise us. I don't remember the man's name that wrote it, but I do remember it came out in 1988. And the only reason I remember that was because the name of the book was 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Well, he gave 88 reasons 
<laughs> Jesus didn't come back. And I am not making this up. Next year he wrote an addendum. 89 reasons why Jesus is coming back. He never got to 90 or 91. Do we know when he's coming back? No. I can't give you an exact date. But here's what I can tell you, and if you've been in church more than once with me, you know you've heard it before. He is coming in your lifetime. He's coming in my lifetime. It's going to happen. Because he's either coming back for the entire church or he's coming back just to get me. But he's coming in our lifetime, either individually or universally. Either way, we got to do what Peter says. Be diligent. Looking for the blessed hope of the return of our Jesus Christ. Doing what? Being in peace, spotless, and blameless. He's coming. I don't know when, but he's coming. And all I can say is like John said at the end of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Questions, comments? Well, then let's close. Father God, again, we just thank you so much for the warning that you have given us and, and the encouragement you have given us through Peter's word to continuously grow as a, as a, as a believer, as a disciple, to, to strengthen our walk with you, spending time with you in your word, in prayer, with your people, all so that we can live in peace, growing to be spotless and blameless, but at the same time, ignoring the ejections of the mockers and letting them know that you, are, you have come, you died, you rose from the dead, and you are coming again. We thank you for the fact that you're patient, that you don't want to see anyone perish. We thank you that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, to pay our penalty so that we can be redeemed and reunited with you. And even though you never ask us to repay you and it would be impossible for us to do, all you ask us to do is to live for you in return. That is our goal. That is our desire to live sensibly and godly, spotless and blameless in the perfect peace that comes from knowing you are our Lord and you are our Savior. We thank you for the gift of life you've given us eternally and abundantly and that we get to enjoy that life now. All because of what you did. So to you we give all praise, all glory, all majesty as we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen. Yeah.